Praise the Lord, all nations. Exalt him, all ye people, for his love, protection is with us. The Lord constantly is everlasting. All praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, indeed you deserve all the praises. And thus we are here today to uplift our hearts and voices to your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. A miracle happened. I left the church a few minutes ago. The church was half empty, and I came back. The church uh, is now three quarters of full. <laughs> and the rest of the empty seats are angels worshiping with us today. Just want to in, uh, invite, uh, thank you all for choosing Clacton Church as your place of worship today. Uh, for all the visitors, for all the members, and for those who hold on tight this building in doing so much, I want to praise you and also praise God for your dedication week after week. And I pray that uh, as we continually worship here, that the community will know about us and they will soon join us so that they also can be part of God's kingdom. Taking part uh, this uh, morning uh, uh, to my far right is uh, the preacher for the hour, uh, Ugo. Ugo has come also with uh, his mum today, and the, uh, your aunt and uh, your daughter. So welcome to, to Clacton, and I pray that God will use you in a mighty way today as you uh, break the word of God to us. And uh, I love that God, God will take uh, the scripture reading for us today. And uh, right in the middle, we have uh, Pastor Isaac, who will uh, take our prayers to the throne of grace. And um, and I know the Bible is concerning you today. On this note, I will uh, ask the praise team to come and join us as we lift our voices. The first hymn is 289. Sorry.
Let's rise up. As we take the opening hymn, three, two, two. universe we are before you today we give all the glory and honor praise be unto your holy name for giving us the strength to be here today father I pray for entire congregation today I ask your peace your strength your joy I pray for those who are sick, any part of your body. I ask in the name of our Lord Jesus, the Christ, the power, the strength in his name. Fill your body. Bring the strength that you need. So I pray. For the entire world, I pray for places that wars are going on. Many lives are wasted. I pray, I ask that peace will reign upon the land of Israel, upon the land of Palestine. So I ask for Ukraine and Russia. I ask for the continent of Africa. The Lord God of your peace will reign through Christ Jesus. I pray for your servant. 
that you have ordained for today's service. I ask for more grace. That your word will come through and bring change, exaltation, courage, and love. Today being a day to celebrate and also remember the great work you did for our salvation. May your salvation be established in your church among your people. In the name of our Lord Jesus, the Christ, I prayed. Amen. Today's scripture reading will be taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. And I read, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf and be reconciled to God. Amen. Amen. Can we ask the deacon now to come to collect our tithe and free will offering, please? Who gave? Ask. And that we gave unto you, Lord. I pray and I ask that your blessings will be upon every soul, every individual. In the name of our Lord Jesus, the Christ. Amen. children in our midst this morning, yes, one minute before midday. So I'm going to be bold to ask someone from the congregation to give the children's story. Even our visitors, David, you good on that? Children's story? You don't have to be good at it. Okay. All right. Ugo will give the children's story. Children, can you come forward, please? Uh, 
Um, okay, so. Aw. Good morning, children. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, children. Good morning, church. Is this still morning? Uh, oh, afternoon. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll just we'll just jump that. So, um, first things first. I, I am a very horrible storyteller, right? So I am not going to tell you a long story, but we're just going to look at something. This is um, something that I shared with the children in Ipswich. It's just common thinking. So let's think. How many of us know what a perfume is? What can you tell me about perfumes? Go on. Sorry? You smell nice. Right, now, walk with me, right? Yeah? If someone walks by you wearing an expensive perfume, you know, the ones that smell from here to Ipswich, <laughs> right? What do you tend to do? Enjoy the smell or say, you smell very nice. Okay, yes, but there was something more dramatic than I'm expecting. For those of us who have watched, like, Tom and Jerry and all those cartoons, you know, when, that's, when that aroma comes to their nose, what do they tend to do? They, um, they walk up to the scent. You follow it, yeah? <laughs> you, in, in the cartoons, you see them, they just close their eyes and they start floating towards the kitchen, which is what they... But the point is... Why, why would you do that? Because it smells nice. It smells nice. It smells good. Right. How many of us have ever perceived the smell of a rotten fish? Or a rotten egg? Not good. That's absolutely horrible. I know, you know in my... In my dialect, we have a saying, but I'm not going to say it the exactly, exact way it is. But um, if you put a drop of rotten egg in a corner in this building, how many people will remain here? Come on. If you put a drop of rotten egg or a rotten fish or a dead rat somewhere, how many people will be left in the hall? Everybody leaves. So why am I saying that? Um, if we can have... A scripture, um, Proverbs 27, I think it is. Um, let me check. I think it's 27 verse 9. Ah, yeah, yes. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 9. If anybody has it in a more contemporary version, like a New Living Translation or something, let's read it and see what it says. Oh, no, 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 sorry, no, no, no. Ointment and perfume delight their hearts, and the sweetness of a man's friend gives delight by heart, hearty counsel. Ooh, what version is that? Is that New King James? New King James, yeah. I want something in. A, does somebody have a contemporary version, like a New Living Translation or Living Word or something contemporary? Yes. Okay, yeah, grab it, please. Because I want. There's something I'm looking for that is not exactly in that version. So we are going to Proverbs, that's after Psalms, and that's before Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. Apologies for the wait, but you will, get, you will soon get to see the idea. Yeah, 27, Proverbs 27 and verse 9. Perfume and incense brings joy to your heart, and the sweetness of a friend comes from the honest advice. Oh, did you hear the second part? So I read the second part of that again. And the sweetness of a friend comes from their honest advice. And the sweetness of a friend comes from... Wait, did you guys hear what he said? The sweetness of a friend comes from what? An honest advice or heart. So... Why, are we, why am I saying this? For children, when you are honest and a friend to someone, 
you are like sweet smelling perfume. Anytime you are friendly with people, people will always want to be around you. Whenever you are horrible and unfriendly to people, you are as good as a rotten egg. Because people will always want to stay away from you. So if you like the smell of perfumes, know that people also like the smell of good friendships. In other words, all I'm saying is be a good... Oh, I can't, you guys can do better than this, right? Be a good... A good friend. Thank you very much. Who wants to pray? Yeah. Okay, well, let, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be a bit biased now. Let me call my daughter to pray. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the children's story. Thank you for the church we learned all about in children's story. Thank you for everyone. Bless us as we learn. Amen. Very much. You can go back to your seats now. Thank you, Hugo, for the children's story. And now we're going to be blessed by a special item before we hear the sermon. today is called then came the morning so what we do what we've been doing just very quickly people ask us to go to other churches and perform there and we do that and we thought well why are we going to perform these items at other churches and we don't even do them here so at least when we practice them we get them right we do it elsewhere we can we can share it with our own members as well so today this is one we did last night at Chelmsford Church. I'm not going to stand here. At Chelmsford Church. Um, so, and we're going to perform for you today. Then came the morning.
person. Amen. Amen. So, first things first. Um, I have a thing. I've had to, <laughs> I've had to somehow teach the folks in Ipswich about what my thing is. So my thing is, if I say amen, and I normally know, I say amen, I expect an amen from you. Until I get an amen that I'm satisfied with, we will sit here till evening. So that's my thing. So if you are hungry, you better give me a better amen. Amen? amen. 
Oh, and people are, oh, yes, <laughs> you guys are hungry. That is good. <laughs> um, uh, the second thing is, uh, I think this is my second time of preaching in Clacton. And for some weird reason, every time I come to preach, the church is empty. So I'm not sure who is being avoided, whether I am the one avoiding the church or people in this church are avoiding me for some reason. Because the church is empty again today. So I'm going to leave this with Adabalison. Please, next time you invite me, please make sure the church is full first. <laughs> Before I get here. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's good to be here. Um, it's always nice when I take a trip to Clacton. One of the reasons being because I, I like the church, I like the people. And the other one is because I like driving, which is not something that's usual with people. I like driving long distances. So it's not very long from Ipswich. It's about, what, 30 minutes, uh, 35 minutes, or yeah. Um, this afternoon, we are going to look at something that it, it kind of hits, it's kind of personal, somewhat. I will share a testimony at the end. Well, you can, I think it's a testimony, but I'll leave, leave it for you to uh, conclude what it is. But we're going to look at reconciliation. And the text we read is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, we focused on 19 and 20, but you can start as far back as uh, 17, 16, and read it downwards if you want some context. But before we go into that, let's just say a quick word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the worship, and you know that I'm, I'm the least person for this sermon uh, to even speak to your people. But I ask that you please forgive uh, my sins, and given that I'm the sort of person that likes listening to himself talk, please restrain me and let your word speak for itself, I pray. And let your children be blessed. And may your name, in, your name alone be exalted, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, before we start talking about it, we're going to go through a couple of texts because um, I, I, uh, I, I, I like something people, some people will know, something called logical reasoning. First of all, how long do I have? There's something happening by 1.30? Is it 1.30 going out? Okay. Um, I like logical reasoning. So... You put things, maybe that's why I did engineering, because I believe you put things in place, they should just make sense. You don't need to spend a lot of time talking. Right? So, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's begin from there. Last quarter, I think, either last quarter or the quarter before, we, in our Sabbath school lesson, we looked at the book of Ephesians. Personally, for me, it was a completely different uh, eye-opening experience. Ephesians chapter 2, we begin from verse 13 to lay down some foundation. If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, you remember my thing. Amen. Amen? amen? I'm reading from the King James. You can follow me with any translation you have. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes far off are now made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one. Are we together? Oh, people want to sleep here this night. For he is our peace, who has made both what? One. How many, do we have our Bibles? Come on, follow me. You're not encouraging me at all. I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 13. We are going to go down to 16 to give some form of context. Let's go back to 13 again, right? But now in Christ Jesus, you who are sometimes far off are made nigh by his blood, by the blood of, the, of Christ, as it says in King James. For he is our peace, who hath made both one. Now, I want you to underscore, underscore both, if you can. Both, we are, that's what we are going to focus on right? And has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments containing the ordinances, for to make in himself uh, of twain one man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both 
that's both again, um, unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Right, so let's think a bit. Um, I, one of my favorite preachers is Randy Skeets. And one thing he says is think. So let's think. He is our peace, verse 14. He is our peace and has made both one. Question, who are both? Okay, oh, I didn't give you guys some, uh, let me give you another background. So my mother is a lecturer. So I grew up in a family where, where when questions are asked, what is expected? Okay, so I'm just telling you. So when I say who are both, that means I'm expecting some response. So think, what do you think the both means? So Jesus' blood is reconciling both. Both refers to how many people or how many sets of people? Two. So who are the two sets of people? And the Gentiles. Right. So now we have a bit of a background. And what reconciles the Jewish and the Gentiles? The blood of Jesus. Now, if you keep reading, this is where Paul kind of concludes this idea. He says, he might reconcile, that's in verse 16, which is where we ended. He might reconcile both to, to who? To God. So now, we're not looking at well, we are actually, because when we read the, the text we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in 19 and 20, Paul says, be reconciled to God. So there are two separate reconciliations that are actually contained in this verse. There is the reconciliation that we call the vertical reconciliation. Does that make sense? Between God and... Because if you go back to uh, 2 Corinthians 5, in fact, let's go there. In fi- um, five, if, um, 2 Corinthians 5, if we read... If we read Chapter um, verse 20, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Or let's start from 19. Actually, 19 is the one I want. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the, the world to himself. So that is the vertical reconciliation. But that was, that's not the only reconciliation that exists. At least, that's not the only reconciliation that the blood of Christ gives. Jesus' death on the cross does not just reconcile us to God. It reconciles us to... Come on, follow me here. It reconciles us to who? I'm going to start speaking in tongues very soon. Jesus' blood does not only reconcile us to God. It reconciles us to who? To, to one another, to each other. Because most of the times we focus on the reconciliation to God and forget that there is also a horizontal reconciliation that has to go on if we have been sealed by the blood of Jesus. And that's what we are going to look at a bit today. So go with me to Matthew 5. Matthew 5 is, actually it's from Matthew 5 to 7. Those three chapters, it's just Jesus preaching. Matthew chapter 5, let's start from verse 21. If you're there, say amen. amen. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka, we're not going to go into the exegesis of that now, just follow me, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother had ought against thee. Pause. I don't know if this English is too old. But when it says rememberest that Thy brother has ought against thee. What does that mean to 21st century English? Who has a grudge with who? Come on, church. From what we've read, who has a grudge with who? The person has a grudge with me. Follow this reasoning. I am not the one that has a grudge. The person has a grudge with me. Right? 24. 
Leave thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to... I don't have anything against him. That's, I want you to follow, because the, the way humans are is, it's if I have something against you, then I go to do the reconciliation. Jesus is saying, if someone else is angry with you, you go. Sorry, am I making sense? Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> and be, um, continuing 24. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gifts. Now, 25 is the one that's very interesting, for me at least. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast in prison. Pause. Let's think. So, when he says, agree with thine adversary, the general idea is there are two people who are having issues. And then he says, in the way. Question. When he says, in the way, what does that mean? What do you think that means? Agree with your adversary while you are in the way. What does that mean? Oh, while you have time, yes, but... So you are on, you are in the way, you are going to somewhere. That's what it means. You are, both you and your adversary are on your way to somewhere. You, uh, yeah, Mike, I don't want you to jump in front of me. Just chill, chill, chill. You are on your way to somewhere. And Jesus is saying, while you guys are still on the way, do what? Sort yourselves out. Because when you get to court... You know, there's this thing in, in, in the legal world where they said you settle, come on, settle out of, you, know, you guys have heard that phrase before. Because when you get to court, that is it. You don't settle out of court when you get to court. So there's no second chance. I want you to have that at the back of your mind because it will come back to the testimony I'm going to give at the end. Right? So he says, God, Jesus says, settle with the person you have issues with before you get to the judge. Because if you get to the judge, in Europe, they say, uh, in Nigeria, they say, oh, Barry, it is finished. It is done. There is nothing you can do out from that point on. So the risk increases with each step you make towards the judgment room. Which is why he said, while well, there is still time. So if we go back to the text we read in 2 Corinthians 5.19, in fact, if you read 20, Paul says um, that we are now ambassadors. In 19, he says, to us, we've been given the word of reconciliation. And then he begins verse 20 by saying, we are now ambassadors. And being ambassadors means that you have a message to carry, right? So the word of reconciliation is the message that we've been given to carry, to go and reconcile. And in that verse 20, Paul then says, I pray you. In fact, if you look at the... The, um, in the Greek for the word pray in verse 20 is I plead, I entreat, I beseech you in the name of God, be reconciled with God while there is still time. what? Time. time. Because once we get to judgment, it is finished. But again, we're not talking about reconciliation with God. That is pretty straightforward. Most of the times we don't remember a lot of the time, we don't actually remember that the, the point about reconciling, not just with God, but with each other, before judgment appears, or applies, rather. 1 John 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. We'll look through a couple of texts, and then we'll conclude. Hopefully, we won't take a lot of time. 1 John, if anybody gets it, you can read. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. <clears throat> I don't think that needs explanation. That is pretty straightforward. We cannot be Christians and have issues. Now, let me explain what I mean by have issues. It is possible to disagree. Are we together? Yes. We can disagree. But like Jesus says, we cannot have ought in the King James. If you have ought against another person, you cannot claim to love God. Because how, can, how on earth are you going to love someone who you can't see? 
there's someone who you can see and you're having issues with that person and then you claim to love, to love someone who, it doesn't make any sense. It is completely illogical. You start from where you are. You start from the known, like we normally say. You go from the known to the unknown. You cannot have any knowledge about the unknown until you have digested what is right in front of you. Now, why is this very important? Matthew 7, the, you know, um, the text we're going to read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, by the way, is a text that we normally apply in a different way, which is not wrong, but I'm, I'm going to give you maybe a different, a different view of that text that will probably tie into what we're talking about this afternoon. Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 13. <clears throat> if you're there, amen. amen. Verse 13, enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. 14 says, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few be that find it. Now, think with me. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the door. So basically, and he said, uh, if any man go in through me, he shall be saved. and shall go in and out and find pasture and all that, right? And then he goes on to talk about the devil. But he's the door, so there's only one door. Now, think with me. Let's say that we only have one door, that door there. This is a wall. That's a wall. That's the only door. If there is a fire, what happens? Come on. Everybody scampers. Now, I want you to watch this. We are sitting far apart now, aren't we? A bit apart from each other. Come on, church, walk with me. Yes. We are sitting apart from each other. What happens when everybody starts going towards the same door? We start doing what? We start getting closer and closer and closer to each other. So when Jesus says the way that leads to life is what? Narrow. Narrow. That means that everybody that goes into that way has to be close to... But the other way that leads to death is what? Is wide, which means I can stay there and somebody else can stay at the other end. And it will contain both of us comfortably. But we are all walking to what? To destruction. Now, if I have a problem with my brother and both of us are going towards the same door, what is the inevitable thing that will have to happen? You will come together at some point. It's either that or both of you go into the broad road and go and die. Am I making sense? That is the importance of reconciliation horizontally. You know, I've heard people who say, uh, okay, maybe let me not go, go there yet. <laughs> one more text and then we start concluding. Matthew 18. Oh, this one was an eye opener for me, <laughs> basically. Matthew chapter 18. Let's start from verse 15. <clears throat> Are we there? Are we there? Yeah. Matthew 18, verse 15. In case you, I, I know I talk very fast. My, my mouth is faster than my brain for some reason. So you have to bear with me. Um, verse 15 of Matthew 18. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So basically, someone hurt thee. What does the next line say? Go and tell Question. Pause. If Michael hurts me, as far as logical thinking, human thinking is concerned. Who is supposed to go to who? Michael goes to you. Oh, Michael is, Michael, I'm not saying, Michael, we are in good terms. The church is not in good terms with me. If Michael hurts me, who normally is supposed to go to who to start the process of reconciliation? That is how the world works. If someone hurts me, I'm, I normally wait for that person to come to me. Can you hear the pride that is in that statement? So I go and sit down in my cushy, cushy, cushy room, having these horrible feelings against someone, waiting for that person to come to me. Jesus says, if someone hurts you, who makes the move? 
you go make the move. Do you know why? Sorry, question. God and us, who hurt each other? Who made the move? In case you're wondering, look at Romans 5.8. In fact, Romans 5.8 says that we were still in sin when Jesus died. Jesus didn't come and say, look, let's have an agreement. If you will stop sinning, I will die for you. Nope. He died first. And if that's not enough, if you go to Genesis 3, if you read the account of Genesis, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, who came looking for who? It was God that came looking. God is always the one that comes looking. He has done nothing wrong. He has every right to sit where he is and wait for us to come. But nope, he won't. He goes looking. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If your brother hurts you, go looking. Why? Proverbs 25. This one is just a segue. It's not really supposed to be part of this talk, Paul. Just to give you some idea. Proverbs 25, 21. Jesus says something similar in this Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Proverbs 25, verse 21. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. Verse 22 says... For, are we there? For you shall heap coals. Okay, so pause and think about that text. Is Because someone can read this and think, oh, you know what? If I have an enemy, if I treat the person right, that's some form of revenge. That's what it sounds like. But actually what the scripture is saying is you will save yourself. Because what you've done is if you're treating your enemy right, and your enemy refuses to accept you, what you have done is you have transferred the liability from yourself to the person. Think about it. That's exactly what God is doing. We are the ones who sinned against God. God came looking, died even for us. So if we do not reconcile ourselves to him, who is at li- who's liable? We are the ones who are liable, not him. He has done everything he can do. So therefore, the hot coals are on whose head? On ours. Like we said, the ball is in our court. Now, for the classic, what we call the Lord's Prayer, sometimes that's one one we skip over very well. Matthew chapter 6. From verse, uh, let's say from verse 7. Uh, well, no, that's too far back. I don't have the time. Verse 9, the classic prayer, right? Matthew chapter 6 from verse 9. <clears throat> After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, come on, who art, who art in heaven, in heaven. yes. Amen. Yes, Amen. thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is here. Pause, pause. You know, that's, an, that's one of the parts of the prayer that we just recite and just skip through. Thy will be done where? On earth. Think about that for a second. That's not light. Do you know how God's will is done in heaven? It's not done, it's not done lightly. But anyway, that's a sermon for you, so let's keep going. That will be done on earth. Keep going. As it is in heaven, yes. Give us this day our daily bread. And slowly now, and as... Do you know that that line is a contract? Think about it. It's a contract. Basically, what we're saying is, deal with me the way I deal with others. Sorry, am I speaking Greek? No. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm still speaking English, that we are together, right? Treat me the way I treat others. Now, because the reason why I say that is, actually, no, before, before I conclude, Luke 11, let's look at the, the equivalent of this from, from Luke's perspective. Luke 11, chapter 2. <laughs> Luke chapter 11, verse 2. You see, I talk, I talk too fast. Actually, I don't know whether I talk too fast or I talk too much, but. 
Verse 4. Let's not read 2. Verse 4. In the King James, it says, And forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Okay, so, in other words, if I don't forgive those who are indebted to me, God will not do what? He's not going to forgive me. Now, why am I saying this? I have heard people who say, I can forgive what he or she has done to me, but I can't forget. It's difficult to forget. So the question I ask is, okay, how would you like God to forgive you then? Do you want God to keep remembering the things you've done? No. Thank you, my sister. Don't mind all these people here. <laughs> because think about it. If I want to be treated the way I treat all, because let's be honest, if I want God to forgive me, I want him to forgive and, forget. and forget it. Which requires that I should, when I forgive someone, I ought to... Then let me even, let's now stretch this. Let's make it worse. Someone breaks your heart. Right? Logically, what you do is you close, you close the heart at least for that person. Or at least you exercise some form of caution. Are we together? Even if you're forgiven, you exercise caution. And that makes logical sense. Now think about this. If God forgives you and me and exercises caution with us, how far can we go? Do you know that when God forgives, he makes himself vulnerable to us? As in, um, how do I explain this? He, he's so vulnerable that even after he's forgiven us, he's open to the extent that we can hurt him again. So are we following? Yeah. He's that vulnerable. So when he forgives, he makes himself completely vulnerable and opens himself up wholly, um, taking on a risk that we will hurt him again. That is how we are supposed to treat each other. When you forgive someone, you ought to forgive the person to the extent that you are vulnerable to that person hurting you again and again and again. I didn't put a text here, but we all know that text where the disciples asked Jesus, how often should... So, and Jesus said what? He said 70 times 7. In other words, as many times as the person comes forgive, um, asking for forgiveness, you do what? You forgive the person. If the person comes a million times, you forgive the person a million times. Why? Because that is exactly how you want God to treat you. It sounds funny. And in all honesty, ooh, do you know that when Jesus made that statement, 70 times 7, I concluded it, the disciples, do you know what they said? They said, Lord, increase our faith. You can go and read, find the text and read it. I think it's still in Matthew 5. That's, that's the next thing they said. Lord, please increase our faith. Because who on earth is willing to make him or herself vulnerable 490 times. Someone breaks your heart. 400, how much of your heart is left after it's been shattered 490 times? But that's how we want God to treat us. Yes. Therefore, it follows that we are going to have to treat everybody else the same way. Otherwise, we find ourselves in that broad and wide road. Yes. Think about it. Someone breaks your heart 490 times, and let's say at the 491st time you refuse to forgive the person. Let's just walk with this, right? And you are so angry at that person, and you get to heaven, and you see that person. Where will you begin? Tell me you are going to be happy. That's not going to happen. Heaven all of a sudden becomes sour. And like we said, there is no way, think about it now. If there are Two people here who are not in good terms. And there's a fire, like we said. And they both have to go through that door. <laughs> that is how important, in fact, that is the extent to the reconciliation we are supposed to go to. I said I was going to close with testimony, so maybe this is the right time to do it. To me, it's a testimony, though. Um, my, my dad, he's late now. 
died uh, about four years ago. So uh, my dad was a disciplinarian. I think that's the word. So he, he was he called him a tough, tough man. At least that's what we called him when we were young. You know the thing with, with being young, especially when you're in your teens, parents are tough, generally. That's, at least that's how it looks. Yes. Parents are unreasonable. Okay. No, that's true, right? So, uh, live through the house and all that, you know, you know, you grow up, you get a job, you move forward, and you grow, and then you find someone, you date, and then you get married, you know, that sort of thing. So, as God will have it, I found someone that I wanted to get married to, which is a different miracle on its own, but I'm not going to go into that one. Um, but then I've already moved, I've relocated to the UK, right? So I was here, my fiance then was in Nigeria, um, and he, she was in a different town to my dad's, my family, right? So <clears throat> we've got this tradition back home, generally, when there is, we, we normally have three different marriages. The traditional one, the church one, and then the typical civil marriage, right? Good. So the the way it's typically done is the traditional wedding is handled by the wife's family. Are we together? The church wedding is handled by the groom's family. Right? And unfortunately, the groom-to-be is not in the country. So technically, you, uh, you, you expect that to fall to the dad, by dad. But during this planning, we had some sort of a fallout because... My wife is this sort of person that she likes things done. In, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Women are such people that they like things done in a, in a specific way. <laughs> right? So, and me being the, I was trying to be a, a reasonable son. I'm like, oh, dad, you know what? Don't bother yourself. Don't make the trips. I will let my wife do, or my fiance then, let her do all the running around and all that. Um, and because of that, um, the venue for the wedding was moved to a town that was closer to her than my parents, which is not usually the norm, because the norm is it's supposed to happen at my parents' church. And my dad kind of found issues with that. And I thought it was a, you know, little thing, so I'm like, you know, let's just sort this thing out. But it kind of just blew out of proportion. Like it, it blew out of proportion. Big deal. It became a massive deal. My aunt is here. She, she can testify to that. It became a massive deal in the family. To the extent that my dad, at some, at some point, my dad said that the wedding was going to happen over his dead body. And I was like, ah, well, okay, that means you're not coming to my wedding. Then I'm going to look for someone else to stand in as my dad. So we just fell out. And so my aunts and my, and my dad's brothers, we now had to have some sort of a massive reconciliation thing. But let me tell you, this is, before I say what I'm going to say, you know sometimes when we have grievances with people, it's usually because we are selfish. We don't tend to see things from the other person's perspective most of the times. And that's really why we have disagreements, because we stick to our own views and we do not actually consider the other person's views. Because one day I was talking to my cousin, her son actually. And, you know, we're, because obviously this is a family thing, so everybody in our family, whether you are at home or abroad, you hear. And I'm the, I'm the, well, I'm not the first son. My elder brother had passed earlier, so I'm now the first child in the family to get married, which is a big deal. Right? So I was speaking with my cousin, and my cousin started telling me things that, look, maybe you should try and consider, see things from your dad's perspective. Consider the life he's had to go through. Consider how difficult things have been for him and why he's the sort of person he is now, right? And that was what I did. So I now sat, sat down and started thinking, and, I, and all the stories that my dad told me, because my dad was in the UK. Um, he was here, that was in the 60s, when he was here on the Nigerian scholarship, when civil war broke out. And the civil wars was basically the government versus my region, I'm from the eastern part, right? So because my dad was on government scholarship and the government was, the Nigerian government was basically fighting a war with the region where my dad was from, the scholarship was cut off. So all of a sudden my dad became stranded in a country in the 60s when you know there was still a bit of racism going on. 
So he was stranded. So he had it tough. And so I started, all those stories I started telling me, I started just replaying all of them in my head. And then my perspective just changed. You know, so a voice kind of just told me, look, why don't you just let this man have this? I mean, it's not like you're going to have another wedding in your life, God willing. This is something that he is the first, I'm the first person in his family as in his immediate family, to get married. So just let him have this. Do you know that while I was thinking that, he was thinking the same thing. He was thinking, let your son just have this. That was what he was thinking. Because when it came to a point where we kind of scheduled a call to kind of, you know, spruce things out, before I could say anything, my old man has already agreed, you know what, let's do it your way. That was what he agreed. Let's do it your way. So that there will just be peace. Now, why is this story important? Because that was in 2000 and... Ooh, when did I get married? Ooh, good. My wife is not here. So, <laughs> um, 2016, <clears throat> right? COVID came in 2019, yes? Uh, 2016. 2017, 18, my dad started having a sickness. We didn't know what it was. By the time it was 2019 COVID, we found out it was cancer. The cancer led to Alzheimer's. And my dad couldn't recognize people anymore. Right? And then, unfortunately, in 2020, I lost my dad. So the question that was in my head, in my head was, OK, Ugu, let's think about this logically. What if you went ahead with that issue? You didn't seek reconciliation. You guys didn't reconcile. And not even my dad died. And your dad then had Alzheimer's and could not remember anything. How on earth were you going to get yourself reconciled with your dad? And then to make things worse, how were you going to reconcile with your dad after he has passed? You know, in, in, in Hebrews, um, Paul made a statement. He says... Um, he said, well, he was quoting the book of Psalms. He said, now is the time. If you hear his voice, well, the scripture says, do not harden your hearts. But me, the way I read it is, if you hear his voice, you better act on it when? Now. 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 So that was the question I was asking myself. Yes. If I had not reconciled with my dad and things got worse, what would my life have been like? Because let me be honest with you. Right? Nobody is going to go to heaven having issues with one person. Yes. It, even if the person you're having issues does not make it to heaven, me having the issues with the person, you having issues with the person, will also not make it to heaven. Yes. If there's someone you need to reconcile with now, better do it when? Wow. Now. Because when the person is dead, if the person dies, that reconciliation process is gone. Remember what we read in Matthew 7, Jesus, Matthew 5, rather, 21. Jesus said, you better reconcile while you two are still on the, on the way because when you get to court, that is it. When that person dies, you are literally in court. So the question is, what will you do? Which is what I'm going to leave you with. Go through your mind. Do I have somebody that has issues with me? Not somebody that I have issues with. That one is simple. Is there anyone that has issues with me? You better go and start reconciling with the person. Yes. Because if you stay there and say, well, I don't have issues with him or her. She or he has the issues with me, so I don't have to do anything. If that person passes, you are literally in court. Not my words. That's what scripture says. So, if there's anything I'm going to leave you with, I'm going to reiterate what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.19. I beg you, in the name of God, be reconciled to God. Ergo, be reconciled to one another. When? Now. Now. 
So I expect if you have issues, at the end of this message, pick up the phone, call someone. Because the chances are that person is maybe also trying to reach you. So be reconciled now before we get to court. Amen. Amen. for that message of uh, looking back in our own life and see if we have to make right with our brothers and sisters so that God himself can forgive us too. Let us stand now to bring this service to a close by turning into hymn number 320. Blessed be the wide, no, blessed be the tide that bind us. Even as against our desires, against our carnal and selfish desires, to ensure that we not only seek reconciliation with you, but in seeking reconciliation with you, dear Lord, we also seek reconciliation with each other. Because where we are going, if we are going to live in harmony with one another, we ought to live in harmony with one another here and now. So, Lord, please through your Holy Spirit that works in us and through us, help us to be reconciled with you and to be reconciled with each other. To the glory of your name I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm so glad to see few youth among us uh, this uh, today, and I'm glad to see you worshiping with us. 
uh, we are trying to plan a youth day com 